Welcome to Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. My name is Mumpulu Giluruma Mohobe. Our objective is to enthuse, inspire, energize, and empower entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs of all stripes here in BW and beyond. We do so by inviting these entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs into our makeshift studio. Sometimes we call them to the restaurant, sometimes we go uh, to our studio and we ask them to share their experiential knowledge, their experiences and their expertise. And we ask them uh, as many questions as we can aimed at empowering you also as a viewer. Jumela, and welcome to another episode of Mohobe Nuggets of Wisdom podcast. As always, I bring you life-changing, impactful uh, information, and uh, normally related to entrepreneurship, as you well know. I have a guest uh, with a difference. <laughs> um, she's going to talk about excellence, but you'll meet her momentarily. But before I introduce her, or she introduces herself, please hit the subscribe button. Um, unfortunately, some of us just watch and we don't subscribe, and it would really help us if you did. Um, welcome to the studio, Mongkhoki Moshaka. Thank you. It is quite an honor to be here. Okay, I'm, I'm honored myself. <laughs> would you care to share a little bit about yourself and your background with the viewer? Okay, thank you. My name is Mongkhoki, mm -hmm. and over the years I've come to understand what it truly means. Mm. which has had a lot of impact in what I do personally and at career level. Mm. By virtue of character and qualifications, I am a transformation strategist and project manager. Mm -hmm. Over the past years, I have worked in different industries, advisory, brand communications, ICT and skills training, which is what led me to transformation strategy as the core of what I do. Mm -hmm. And today I would like to share a bit more based on my experiences, client interactions and areas of study on excellence at a personal level at, at, and <laughs> excellence at a personal level as well as an organizational level. Mm -hmm. How do we achieve that? Okay, yeah. we're going to um, interrogate that in a moment, but do you just want to share a little bit of your academic background as well? Okay. I studied my undergrad in computer science mm -hmm. and then from then onwards I did my master's in project management mm -hmm. and I have had the honor and thrilling discovery of also studying quality management and skills training. Mm -hmm. These were just to beef up and extend my areas of interest from the main qualifications that I had. Yes, and I am also the founder of Transformit. It's a consulting agency that I have been successfully running mm -hmm. <laughs> throughout the challenges for the past five years now. Yes, um, our core services are advisory at business, I mean, organizational level, brand communications, ICT, and mm. skills training. I happen to know that you have music also in your history. Can you <laughs> I think touch on that a bit? <laughs> okay, that is something I was born into mm. or born with. I am an artist. Um, more celebrated as Trippy Re. Mm. I've got a nomination. Trippy Trippy mm -hmm. Re. Mm. Yes, it actually came from rhetoric because that was my style of speech mm. when I was a poetess. Mm. And it, it does, it actually gives me the recognition and fulfillment, mm. um, which also contributes to me feeling like personal excellence really is something that you can't be impulsive about mm. because it helps me balance that is a passion and a talent that I'm using mm -hmm. and knowing that it doesn't expire I always go back to it when I need to unwind okay yeah what does rhetoric mean in this <laughs> uh, context or is it just a name it, it used to be just a name but it was my style of speech mm -hmm. yes it was supposed to elaborate that my content is thought-provoking mm -hmm. yeah Okay, it's full of rhetorical speech. Yes. Okay, and Mongkhoch, um, you said, has significance as well. Yes. Some people don't know what it means in English. Um, <laughs> the one um, who leads um, me. The one who leads me and the one who's also my anchor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, now let's just break it down in terms of what we're coming to discuss. Let's start with self-awareness um, because you said it, it, it influences when we were prepping for the show, you mentioned that it influences your decision. What is self-awareness 
and how does it influence your decision making process okay. as an individual? Self-awareness, like the word awareness is, it means knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. Not just the person that you want people to hope, the person that you hope people see you as, but more of who you truly are. Mm. And this comes down to your character, your personality, your preferences, your boundaries, your skills, your talents, and your nature. Mm. The person I am right now on this show is more of a responsive, it's not really my personality. It is size of my character, which I've been provoked. Mm. So if I know who I am, mm. I need to be able to confidently explain what these different sides of me are mm. from my personality, what influences my personality, the transition and changes that I've had in personality from being a tomboy to just a girl in varsity to the woman that I am now. Mm. And the, definitely this is not the ceiling. That is how you get to know if this is the ceiling or not because you are self-aware. Mm -hmm. There's still things that you think about and they make you want to do more or be better. And then there's things that you think about and you realize, you know, this is my boundary. Mm. This is, is it a process do you, for you to achieve self-awareness? Is it a process you have to undergo? Yes, it so, is a continuous how do you go about process. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm big on journaling, so I tend to like just go through what I have been journaling about my experiences mm -hmm. and pick up little trends. Mm -hmm. You know, like say for example, as an employee, I know times when I'm likely to be late or notice that, you know what, during this season I was late a lot because I was uninspired to go to work, but because I lacked the confidence to communicate whatever was causing that attitude towards mm. the workplace mm -hmm. I, I now became the latecomer but it mm -hmm. doesn't mean i don't respect time it means i lacked something either the boundary or the confidence to communicate what i need support with mm -hmm. and which is why i was saying it's a continuous process because you need to know who you are mm -hmm. who you want to be and then there's the way that people actually perceive you there might be a great difference between who I think Mukuri is because I know I can do more and then I don't do more so mm. people know what, I, what they actually mm. get. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really why it has to be a continuous process okay. and it has to be thorough because once you've lied to yourself about the person you are, mm -hmm. that's the image you want to present all okay. the time. Let's talk about the organization, uh, one with IT. Um, how it was started, how it was formed. Share a little bit about that. <laughs> um, I've always wanted to be a boss, first of all. Mm. I think also growing up seeing my parents having other businesses, a business, some of them running at home, I was so curious, what is, what is it really like being a boss? Mm. And what does it mean? And so when I graduated, I had a few jobs here and there, but I've always had a job. And I always felt like, because I'm not old enough, I can't do certain things a certain way. So I always wanted to work in an environment that supports employee interest as well, not just coming in and sticking to the routine. And then I worked at, um, I was actually on an internship at KPMG in 2017. Mm -hmm. And when we got there, part of the onboarding exercise was goal setting. I had never actually had to do goal setting in my life. Mm -hmm. I always had goals or resolutions, but I'd never sat down and even tried to think about how this goal could have impact on anything else. And then I was like, I need to work in an environment like this, but mm. I want to make that environment and factor other things. Because as a creative, sometimes you get a pushback because people know you mm -hmm. from a, as a certain persona. So it's mm. very hard for them to switch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is really what like inspired. the new Tupi array and now this is yes, something else. They can't compartmentalize what this is this person that was that talent that was mm. that talent excuse me mm. but this is the qualification and skill that they're coming in here with mm -hmm. so that inspired my name the company name transform it mm -hmm. yes because um a part I of thought it was it meaning <laughs> that there's an element it of is an information yeah. yeah the it part is it like that is our tool for transformation it was a main tool mm. but really it is transform it mm -hmm. whatever it is you need to transform it for it mm. to grow mm -hmm. yeah okay goal orientation versus growth orientation i guess we need to define the terms first and then contrast them mm -hmm. mm. um goal orientation from my learning uh, through experience and study is where somebody is driven everything that i do is aligned with the goals that i have 
and then there's growth orientation I can achieve my goals let me let me just quickly get to goal growth orientation it's where anything and everything I touch must grow me mm -hmm. regardless of the goals I have so we tend to stick more to the goal orientation of our being mm -hmm. yeah i achieved this i got a merit on my masters i was nominated for this mm -hmm. i got a long service award but sometimes we're just in the ceiling mm -hmm. yeah you're getting all these accolades but it doesn't necessarily translate to growth it's just validation that indeed you are good at this your first tier when it comes to the sphere this mm -hmm. is really your forte and growth orientation is realizing that I'm achieving these goals, but I'm not growing. And you achieve them because you're capable, not because you can do more. It's very interesting, eh? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I got to realize that over time, people would give me props for achieving certain things that I didn't even get to celebrate because I had to. It was a need to do. Mm. It, it, it's not as fulfilling because sometimes it's from delegation or a client requirement yes you achieve the goal but does it actually translate to impact and mm. growth mm -hmm. yeah how, how does one position themselves from what do you, your answer i think we should be striving to be growth oriented more than goal orientated so how, how does one position oneself for growth it brings us back to the self-alignment and mm. self-awareness because mm. then you have to be aligned mm. I can't grow in an area where I can't even speak out. If I can't ask for help in a project, then I'm only going to be doing the bare minimum. Mm. If I can't even have an honest and honest self-appraisal, I won't know areas that truly need improvement. Mm. Maybe I'm the bad problem. I'm the problem here, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it's comfortable to say management does not support this thing. So I just choose playing that victim card all the time instead of realizing that I never even communicated that was a problem to mm. start with. I expect people to do things on my behalf mm. or it instruct or delegate and then come back to shine. Mm -hmm. So when you're growth orientated, you actually sit and realize, listen, this is what you tend to do. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to unlearn and relearn to become the person that you truly could be. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so let's take it now to excellence, which is our main subject uh, at organizational level. How do you f define excellence? And, and then the second part of the question will be as to how we apply it in, in a, at an organizational level. I think at an organizational level, mm. excellence would be your operational growth. Mm. And by operational from the people, mm -hmm the technology mm -hmm. to the organizational culture being clearly communicated. Sometimes you'd find maybe as a recruitment activity, we just get somebody to fill the gap, not somebody to create impact. So the way that we're dealing with that employee is we're just delegating and instructing. You'd find many organizations to date still don't perform performance gap analysis or skills gap analysis. They have a strategy and a five-year plan that they're sticking to, but it's not custom or cultured for certain employees. For all you know, you might have an ambidextrous employee who can um, be a great ICT advisor and a great project manager, but because they know the value for data, this is the person you could be adding when you're sitting there developing your marketing strategy because mm. they have all this back-end information from both sides. Mm -hmm. But because we're not focused on the culture, mm -hmm. We're just looking at what is supposed to be done and what billable hours you have, what's HR saying about this person. Mm. We end up missing those areas that could really be helping us grow as an organization. Mm. Yeah. So the, the, how does communication um, help? It helps because if you have a clear communication strategy mm -hmm. from the tools to the channels, mm. points of escalation, and making sure that even at one-on-one -on -one level, employee to leader or the other way around, mm. you know that these are, are fit, feedback expectations. Mm. Okay. From the acknowledgement to the response and me contributing. Because mm. you'd find maybe I get a quarterly review as an employee, but in between I have never actually had a conversation with whoever I report to that, listen, this is what I'm noticing. 
Mm -hmm. It used to take me an hour to perform this task, but now it's taking me two hours and it makes me look incompetent because in between your expectations, there are now other instructions and sometimes from outside departments. Mm. So I tend to look incompetent because I'm overspent as a resource, mm -hmm. not because I'm optimized. Mm -hmm. And then you realize if perhaps I suggest to Ram Mohobe as my boss or manager, mm. or leader rather, <laughs> as my leader, mm. that let me finish this. Do mm. not assign anything else to me until I've done this and mm. then you go and inspect or review whatever I've performed. Mm. And then I can carry on with the other task. So you're optimizing me. I'm not spread thin mm -hmm. and trying to please everyone and everything. Mm. And then everything is just at a mediocre level. Mm -hmm. Next thing, no promotion, mm. no salary increment. And as a brand ambassador, I'm the immediate brand ambassador of the company after the directors. Mm. It's me. I'm going to start talking about how the company is a bad place to work at. Yeah, every Not employee a, does that. Every employee at some point will be like, mm. but people hardly express that. Mm. Or even if they do, sometimes they don't have reason. Mm. Or like backup, data to backup. Remember when you assigned that thing to me? I was also assigned this by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And there's two different lines of instruction now. So that conflict, mm. no levels of priority. Mm. How do you overcome that initial resistance that might come from shyness or fear for the employee to communicate uh, the challenges? I think. Um, besides having a clear communication plan that highlights all of these, mm. it would be also understanding as a director or as um, top tier management, if the leaders or supervisors actually create that environment. Because you find sometimes it's lack of expression because there's intimidation. Intimidation is the leadership tool mm. or the management tool. It's not a clear open environment where listen, you're a peripheral staff member, I'm the boss here. Instead, you know, instead of that, it could be, listen, we're working towards this goal. This is your accountability in achieving it. This is your role. Mm. So instead, collaboration becomes a thing of who now gets the shine. Mm. So besides that, skills training mm -hmm. so this is why soft skills training has to be a continuous exercise in every company because sometimes i might just be in the back end in the server room thinking okay the network is up there's no problem yeah. but when it comes to working in collaborative projects i struggle to, I struggle, mm -hmm. me, to even express anything because i don't know what effective communication yeah. is i yeah yeah so you, skills training. using your own uh, experience having gone from corporate to your own business was there any adjustment challenges or any uh, adapt <laughs> adaptation uh, challenges that you experienced going Ooh. from a large corporate to being thrown into the deep end it was on your own? it was a very interesting transition mind you i just come fresh out of an environment where everything is time sensitive it's a billing environment mm. you know to, and also having just come up with the realization that I need to be goal oriented when I'm at work. Um, it made me set up this company with this environment and I had all these policies, but instead I was working with people who'd never been in corporate. So I really had to test all these principles and ideas that I had. Is this just theory or does it work only in certain environments? And mm. it was not the, the best part of it because mm. I'd be working with a freelancer who's never been in an office, doesn't even own a pair of formal shoes and I expect them to communicate clearly. Mm. I've already committed to a client so it was a lot of risk to handle. Mm -hmm. And then once I had that sorted out and understanding that sometimes the environment really plays a big role. I can work from home but in a team environment there's shared resources and not that we would be trying or I would be trying to micromanage, but I need to be thorough because I'm new and everything is on the line, the mm. reputation and the cost of reproduction. So it made me really thorough and understand I need to always have a quality management mm. framework. Okay. Yeah. It's been what, three, four years now? It's my fifth year now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. How has it been? <laughs> it's 
been interesting. Mm. The first three years, because our core service was social media marketing and management, it hadn't become a thing yet mm. or a big deal yet. So you were thriving. Mm. And I remember I was one of your early clients. You were one of our first clients. You didn't even flinch. And I always remember that and appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And I think the, the challenge also was realizing, listen, you can't run a corporate brand mm. or a separate legal entity the way you'd run your personal profile. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot also that made me understand different business risks at reputational level as well. Mm. That was good, it was great. And then that's when we started now focusing more on other things like operational excellence, mm. delivering ICT advisory, finding the bridge for integrating like synergy in a company. Mm -hmm. And I've had um, collaboration with other companies, skills trainers, app developers, and it also helped me to understand the value, the true impact of whatever service I'd be offering to somebody. This can't just translate to this project. What is the business impact of this thing? Because how mm. this is somebody else's yard, mm. and you better leave a mark. Indeed, yeah. indeed. And um, we're, we're just coming out of COVID. Um, how has it impacted you? and? Any, um, any, any, any positive or negative stories out of that? Whew. It had negatives. Lucky for us, during the lockdowns and everything, we were allowed to work because it's media and information. And most of our clients... Essential services. Essential services, exactly. And most of our clients were also just running day-to-day -day activities like normal. Mm -hmm. um, and then also during that, that's when I really understood the need for performance and standards and controls because you're working with some people who are working from home. Mm -hmm. Not that they're being lazy or just too comfortable, but they have limited or restricted access to certain resources that they need for the collaborative project. And on top of that, you just think, oh, you know, I'm going to wake up at whatever time, then quickly knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> but you just keep taking those walks to the fridge for mm. nothing, mm. you know. Mm. And it was, it was a very crazy experience. And I use crazy for a reason because you're moving from an environment where you're used to reaching out to people. Mm. Now you're just at home mm. doing what needs to be done if at all that day you have that strength. Mm. Yeah. Business-wise, I mean, uh, financially, it, 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 there were opportunities that came from it, especially even on the tech side, because now people needed more advisory. The guys who are shying away from technology now realized the they real... They had no option. They had no option. Mm. So that really helped us. And also, at the point, that's when I realized, you know what, some of these services that we're offering, they're really DIY skills. Mm. Anybody can do that for themselves mm. or... Anybody could train an employee, then cut us out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it made me really rethink. And it happened to some of your clients. It happened with most of our clients. Mm. And also after having worked with a client a certain time, you have the onboarding training, so they understand what you're doing and the impact. So over time, they also learn how to do it themselves, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. If a client can learn from me and feel like they no longer need me for that very service, great. It shows that really what we're doing is visible. But did, did you then have to upskill yourself? I had to upskill myself. Mm. I had to learn quality management systems. Mm. I had to learn data analytics so that I can consult now. Listen, you have your marketing agency, but you also have this data bank. Let's come in, develop the trends for you. You don't even know how old your repetitive sales, where your repetitive sales come from. Sometimes you just you're just concerned with Mm -hmm. What is the bottom line? What is the figure at the bottom? Mm -hmm. Without even realizing, listen, Mokori has been my client for the past eight years, and this is what she normally buys. This is the season she normally buys. Mm. So this is now what I do, mm. data-driven strategies, mm -hmm. with the evidence to back it up, because these trends or like the project document documentation really shows us the productivity levels, the slum, mm. The predictions now. You just keep thinking, yeah, that's this nice place. I always see it on Facebook. So that is the fame now, part of it, the popularity. Mm -hmm. It has established the brand, the brand, excuse me, the brand placement, but it hasn't translated to sales yet, mm -hmm. which is the business impact that we need. So the popularity would be your brand recognition, your brand placement, mm -hmm. and then when it comes now to sales. And client That's retention. the impact. That is the impact. Because yeah. that is the reason we're up and running anyway. Yes. Yeah. Reason for existence. That is the reason for <laughs> existence. And that is where 
we can even fund our growth you mm -hmm. know it's not just the day-to-day -day experiences so mm -hmm. And this is something where I always have to sit with our clients during onboarding that. It's fine, we can get you the likes. Mm. But what are the internal processes like in your company? Because it's one thing for me to come shoot and, you know, we've spent so much time away from core business. And then when clients actually walk in from the parking, it's not clean. That is the first impression. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah. As soon as I walk in, there's mm. somebody in reception, I don't know if they're an employee So, that's, that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. It comes down to the internal process. So the processes. impact is going to come from how you make the customer feel. How you make the customer yeah. feel. It's the main thing. Mm. Even if they don't get the service they walked in for. But it's that treatment, feeling like mm. I'm worthy. What does it take for us as Botswana to cultivate that mindset? Because an average business here doesn't doesn't believe that you have to make a customer feel a certain way. Mm. It comes back to onboarding, honestly. Mm. Our recruitment processes here aren't customer-centric. They are role-centric. So if our onboarding activities don't emphasize on attitudes in the workplace, mm -hmm. we're going to come in here with whatever organizational culture we had from the past, it's going to come here, might even rot everybody else around. Or I'm going to learn the passive. Normally, first week, you know, I'd be sitting up straight, good posture. And then two weeks down the line, I'm slanting, I have my headsets on. Mm. And if somebody's on the phone, to me, continually you know, scrolling, scrolling, ignoring customers, ignoring customers, and feeling like, Nara chaisa, am I not going to get the service? Mm. Or maybe because I'm buying a full table, three mm. platters, those are the guys I want to focus on because I'm going to get a bigger tip. No. The fact is, I'm here now. This mm. is the impression that I need to leave with that this was a good decision to go yeah. there. And besides that, it also, employee well-being plays a big role. Uh, you asked me about how COVID was. I learned then that there's absenteeism mm. and presenteeism. If I'm unwell, I should communicate so that I can go home and recover or to the doctor, whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. But there's people who drag themselves to work. Already, by the time I'm leaving my house, I'm like, Ish, mm. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Because you left, you were getting ready to go and survive. Mm. You're not getting ready to go to work. You're yeah. going because you're expected to. So you come here and you're just present. Yeah, I think that point leads to the question of motivation. Mm. And uh, you, you educated me that two types, you know, extrinsic and intrinsic. Um, I want you to give an example of what, what the company can uh, in terms of working on these two types of motivation. Mm -hmm. What we do is, first of all, we, from an organizational perspective, we look at your company goals and your strategies mm -hmm. and your teams. Because yes. those play a And then once we've established what the company's performance needs are, then we now look at the, do these people need to go for training? Do we need to upgrade your technology? Or do we need to find different skills training programs from attitudes in the workplace to uh, operational teamwork and also other techno, um, you know why this person is in delivery because <laughs> hi, it's Excel. <laughs> you know, doesn't know what a computer is. They don't know what a computer <laughs> is. So also training on tools mm. that are used to deliver service. A good example would be, we did a training program. They had very senior employees. They started with the company. They're shying away from technology because they feel as though it's going to expose the mm -hmm. lack of, they'd rather stick to documenting things on mm -hmm. paper. The similar to look of to go seven scot a sing now, no CBD, you scot a company yeah. works, you know? And it's like, yes. You have grown, you have been here with the company, but did you grow with it? Mm. Or did you always have this job? Because mm. it's a major difference. So sometimes you realize the resistance to change is the reason why we're not getting the output that we need. Computer, I don't even like computers because they scare me. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things that we do. And maybe So how do you get those type of people to... We do also... I mean, they, they should realize they're not dinosaurs. So I think they're not. How, how do you help them realize that? One-on-one -on -one conversations. If mm. the company already has that culture, it's easy for us. Mm -hmm. If you have somebody at 59 and somebody at 19, we need to observe how are these people performing. 
we do sampling to realize every day but there's another person doing the same task. I challenge myself in my organization where I have people who've been around the longest and are very loyal, passionately loyal, but refuse or fail to adapt. It levels everything, it levels the ground. Mm -hmm. Once we get there, we're equals, and I'm no longer Mama Shara, who's been in the company for 19 years. Mm. I'm just another member of the cohort. If they do express that this is my fear because I haven't had exposure, or because I'm concerned for what now this means for my role mm -hmm. after this training or introduction of this tool, mm -hmm. does that mean now I'm obsolete? Because I'm no longer responding to client queries personally. There's a chatbot that's doing all of that, and there's the mm. menu options. So what about my job? Mm. There's this new mm. tool that's doing my job. Mm. If I don't go for training, the tool won't work. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Another thing, still on the subject of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation, mm. I've read somewhere that um, money is not really the best motivator. Uh, in a work environment that, <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot more to it than just money. And in fact, some employees would be passionately committed to a job if there are certain other things other than money. Money is, is, is not... Uh, what is your view on that school of thought? <laughs> it's, it's debatable. But in this very day and age where people can be can learn a skill online today and consult from wherever, including the very office that you hide them in. Mm. And that is the reality. They do. They, they do, do their work. And they do <laughs> they their do. work. Mm. They do. Uh, my, my thinking about that is, this is why goal setting is important when you're onboarding an employee. Because now you'd be able to translate financial goals, um, team goals and all of that so you, you can you can actually at some point observe okay this person wants us to have some sort of society or club maybe a cycling club it means they're big on fitness mm -hmm. and if the work environment does not allow for them to bond or have other other activities besides their role besides their core function if it doesn't allow them that we're social beings mm -hmm. definitely I'm going to look for it elsewhere if there's a company that has culture Fridays that's something to look forward to. It's, it has nothing to do with the money. I might be very unhappy with the amount of money that I'm getting, but there's those little things like culture activities and regular training, mm -hmm. tree planting, that speak more to now my personal interests and passions. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a part of the pride as a brand ambassador that or last week we were at SOS playing with the kids. You know, those are things that... Doing that as a, as a as team a, effort, as a team, team building effort. effort. Yes, mm. and it makes you realize also that there's a personal sense to the company. Mm. It's not just some building that you walk in and you, mm. you face the problem and resolve it and then get paid for resolving it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, then, yeah. sorry, yeah. there's also other things like well-being at a mental and emotional level. Because if an environment is toxic, that growth is not going to come out of it. Mm. You're constantly in survival mode. So if I'm earning 500 for a task, that I could be earning 254, but it's more a flexible environment, and there's even, um, what is it called? Other perks. There, there are other enough. perks, but mm. there's also a th there's work therapists. Mm. Yeah, companies are now hiring that as a role, like mm. the therapist at work, mm. to discuss little traumas and little incidents at work that affect my thinking and productivity. It's Could no be, longer just an HR function then? No, it's no longer just an HR function because there's the HR aspect, mm. which is focusing on the human resource. Mm -hmm. And then there's a new sphere that focuses on culture alone. And that has many factors from somebody could be bothered by this chain of being economic, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's little things that really contribute and the more we interact with people or get exposed to other company cultures, we start wondering why it's not happening in our environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very interesting indeed. Let's move on to self-appraisal um, because now we're going at a personal level. Mm -hmm. um, attitudes in the workplace, scale of uh, you know, priorities and so on. What is self-appraisal and, and is it a must for every employee? It definitely is. Hmm. 
I, I like to think a good employee is a self-managing employee. And for you to carry out a self-appraisal, you must be able to document. Because that's really where the truth comes out. Mm. If I give you a timesheet, and every day you have to think about what you were doing at that very hour, or finding ways to fill up the timesheet, mm. then it shows there's a productivity gap. Mm -hmm. If you're idle, okay, cool, but can you do something, or have a review, or contribute somehow to your own growth? Idle time, it happens everywhere. But there's issues, <clears throat> there's issues and instances where I'm overworked. My timesheet is packed, but there's still no result. So if you are a self-managing employee, you're able to realize that I focus on minor tasks during core hours. Documenting a timesheet shouldn't be happening at my core hour at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. when my mind is fresh, when I should be crunching the numbers, you know. Mm. It's something that you can do easily towards the end of the day and something that you can just script or grab your phone, mm -hmm. do a voice note and then transcribe later. Mm -hmm. But instead, we do the little things because we lack the motivation to face critical tasks. Sometimes because we know we can't actually deliver, mm -hmm. but we're afraid to ask for help. Or it's a situation where you just really don't know what mm. you're supposed to do. You just reminded me of a book by Brian Tracy um, when he says, eat that, you know, that frog that first. Frog. <laughs> yeah. yeah, eat that frog. Basically saying, do that tough job first at the beginning. And only then can you talk. Because you say we, we shy away from critical tasks and spend our time on the small unimportant ones unimportant ones because also those ones make us feel good about ourselves mm. because you complete it so that that fulfillment you get from completing a task even if it's a very minor mm -hmm. it still makes you feel like yeah i did something but the critical ones force you to even realize that i actually lied at my interview mm. <laughs> i do not have the skill now can can an employee actually have a special form that you create to self-appraise or yes. how does it work yes um we do actually have those but some of the um, systems that companies use actually have those for timesheets mm -hmm. some companies end up contracting us to develop erp systems where clients or where employees can just log in mm -hmm. and you can do it daily or weekly depending mm -hmm. on your efficiency where you can log between eight and nine I was doing research for this proposal and it took me five hours to draft mm -hmm. and between um, while I was waiting for the review I was working on the feedback that I got on the previous proposal mm -hmm. and it also shows you where you'd struggle or take long to complete mm -hmm. if I if it takes me three hours to do research and there's open internet then maybe the company needs, needs to invest in their R&D as a department can you mean if there's no open internet? No, I'm saying if I'm still struggling in the, struggling in this open internet, internet era, yes. Yes. Yeah, right. I could be even learning or doing research from junk mm. websites mm. where it's not validated, it's not peer reviewed, it has no data to back up. It's just somebody's opinion or work experience, mm. and I'm gonna run with it because this project or proposal yeah. is due. And then you get to realize I don't even have quality or any reference at all. I can't remember where I got it. I have to go on my search history to back up what I'm proposing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in terms of your experience uh, in your company, are you able to uh, blow your own trumpet, so to speak, and share <laughs> some success stories without necessarily mentioning names, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to excellence? You know, A, I found A, I turned into to B, that sort of situation. Okay. Um, we do have those. Um, mostly even from our brand comms, maybe we'd come in or get a call from a client, listen, I need to grow my company on social media. And then when we're doing our brand audit, we realize, listen, your brand is doing well. It's the people that aren't. This is what we got from our sampling from your customers who are on the database that they didn't come back because somebody sucked their teeth at them when they had a complaint, you know. Mm somebody didn't deliver at the time they're supposed to and I left my office to go and wait for the delivery at home mm. you know and we end up learning that the main issue is always internal so we ended up um, like for a client of us we're supposed to be doing brand communications external brand comms we ended up developing a stakeholder management framework for them and system to, to feed that mm -hmm. it included employee task activities 
they need data sheets mm -hmm. where leaders and supervisors can have a review to see if the performance is actually suited. Okay. And besides having the data now to influence that, we also defined search systems for them. This is what you need to look at if you're going to be developing anything, whether it's a marketing strategy or a new employee policy, go through the data. This is how you search, this is how you filter, this is how you can predict your own trends and change the customer culture. Mm -hmm. Change the employee culture because they're different. Same goals, same activities, but the impact is not the same. Mm. Yeah, and there's a client of ours that we also helped to optimize his human resources because um, it's one thing to have employees, but if you don't see them as a resource, you're going to find out that some of the clients that you have, you're underbilling or they're paying you the right amount of money, but you are spending more on the client than what the client is giving mm -hmm. because you don't have service level agreements. You don't have standardized performance um, structures. Mm. So maybe I'm designing something for you, like a logo. Mm. Say, Mokore, I need a logo, and I tell you, it'll take me five days to deliver that logo because of our queuing system. If you're okay with it, great. Or if you say, listen, do whatever you can do to expedite. I'm just thinking about how you're going to be paying the express fee. I'm not thinking about the commitment to other clients. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. That's all you focused on. Yeah, Yeah, I'm just thinking. And if you're thinking of other clients, you say, no, I won't be able to do that. Say, listen. You turn down the express fee. You turn fee. it down and say, let me let you know. Then I go back and find out with my design team, what is the progress on what's already in our hands? Mm. If I can, I'll tell you, listen, I can deliver, but please anticipate a delay. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I have to communicate with you that these are feedback systems. You don't just come and say, what do you mean? That's what is so nice vague. Yeah, yeah. It's so vague. We need explicit communication, mm. exchange of explicit communication. And you have two reviews. Mm -hmm. So if we send you three ideas, you have to pick one and then we run with it. Mm -hmm. And with that one idea, you only get two reviews. It's not yeah. like I'm up all night waiting for you to change your mind. So in that case where you assisted the client, did you actually assess the impact on the bottom line or did you get feedback as to the positive impact outcome of your intervention? We did because we had a post-implementation period of three months. So we got to really see the impact. Is this um, change in behavior because we're fresh out of training or yeah. is there actual ownership mm -hmm. of the new culture? And for them, obviously, it, tran it translated to financial gain. But also, they now have a system, so whoever's coming in mm -hmm. is now walking into a culture that's predefined. Yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. Yeah. Let me go on a tangent and ask you about your relationship with your dad, <laughs> insofar as um, when we, you did some, he did some training for us here, I saw you with him, and throughout you were quiet. How, what, how does that work? I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember you doing I, anything. Was it was this just like you were in a classroom? What's going on? Um, I do most of um, the pre-planning for training, but I also not for, just for his company. Yes, I, I actually do consult for his company from mm. module development to other administrative work. Mm. But mostly my course, the R and D. I do the R and D for mm. the company. For those who don't know, your dad is <laughs> Talo mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and that's somebody I really like working with. First, there was, you know, a blurred line. It just seemed like I'm doing this because my dad asked me to, and then eventually it turned to, you know what, you're doing this for the company, which also you work for or work with. Mm. Yeah, um, but mostly during training, I'm there to transcribe. I'm observing everything from body language to questions asked, so I can pick up trends like, from how are people actually perceiving training? Is this client wasting money on training on people who just went for training because it's a break from work? Mm. Or do they understand the impact of their role, which is why they're being trained so that they can become more efficient? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that is what I do. And Besides, then you put together paperwork after that. I put paperwork together after that mm. and also observe um, maybe if there are questions from the cohort or mm. concerns that, listen, this is where we need decision support from the leadership. Mm -hmm. Then that becomes my role now to okay. assess and advise. So how long have you been consulting? 
I started consulting for him when I was still in Butu. This was what, 2012, I had my first job mm -hmm. with GTN. Mm -hmm. And then I was just filling in because the person who was supposed to be assisting him couldn't show up work done well. Mm -hmm. So I was just typing and then it sparked interest. I'm like, what? Is this is how people really act at work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then over time, I started enjoying it, and, mm. but formally or like officially as a consultant, I started consulting in 2017. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And I think it's a good partnership, right? It is. It is. <laughs> Sometimes mm. I work overtime because I know how important it is, mm. and because I'm family, I can't take a chase. Mm. Yeah. Who's supposed to take ownership of this thing? Yeah. Yeah, but besides that, it's also very really interesting working with my dad. When I was younger, I used to think he was just too thorough. Mm. Yeah. I, he'd ask me, please iron these pants for me and this. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> mm. And I do stuff like I'd achieve a lot. I grew up a very active child from sports, music, career affairs. And I'd come home super excited, like waiting to tell them all about it. Mm. And you know, I'd get a smile, maybe a hug or a pat on the shoulder, good job. Mm. But guys, I won a prize. Like, mm. no, I, I'm teaching you something. When you finish the job, you have to clap hands for yourself, mm. not other people. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll never be happy. You have all these accolades, but you'd be so empty inside mm. because you're doing it for show, mm -hmm. not for fulfillment. Okay. So working with him, I got to see it now firsthand, what it really means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your advice for other daughter-father partnerships, or shall I say, you know, uh, child-parent partnerships that are involved in business together? It's a legacy. Mm. you're not the boss you're business partners and this is the one person you should be teaching everything so they have to rotate across every aspect or department within the company so that they can understand they're not there to fill in for that employee who didn't show up or they're not there to do the little tasks that you don't have time for this is the person who will continue the legacy and the one thing that I always feel like in family businesses is you have to also hear out your child. They're coming from a different background, from school to social culture. They know what's actually going on out there, and there's a way that it'll always have impact. Mm -hmm. For example, you may not be that big on social media, or you might use social media every day, but they know the actual hacks mm. from your camera to features. Very true, yeah. yeah, and if you don't actually allow them to contribute, you won't realize other ways that you could be growing the company from the culture to mm -hmm. the impact that it has. So you really need to make it a partnership and not a condescending thing with like, because I say so. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the art of negotiation. Is it something <laughs> that you teach or is something that you, you live and experience? Both. I think a bit of both. Still, it draws back to the self-awareness thing and having boundaries and goals and preferences because mm. that is really what influences your negotiation what it is that you want to get out of anything whether it's a personal engagement or business you need to know your non-negotiables like listen i'm not getting this time back so you're not about to waste it mm. you know once you know your non-negotiables it narrows because down once everything. time is wasted it's gone it's gone mm. you can pay me back i can make the money back mm. i might even spend that money on nothing after i get it mm. but the time and the experience sometimes we don't remember but it it also contributes to our nature which is also a problem. So if you don't draw boundaries, mm. then your negotiation skills will be terrible. Mm. You won't say if this is a no win or no go for you, or if you, you, you never even know if you're able to get more from. How did you develop the art of negotiation yourself? Was it through <laughs> reading or through experience? How does a listener who feels that they are, they are, they are not negotiating well enough, how, how can you give them that impetus? based on your experience? Mm -hmm. uh, I think a part of it was natural. Being the youngest child and having two brothers, I always had to negotiate, you know, mm -hmm. like, listen, if you do this, I'll do this for you, you know? Mm. But truly, it became solid when I did contractual ma management. It was a module under project management where I got to learn um, 
what it really means, like the value exchange, your terms of references. Mm. But I also did read a book called The Art of Negotiation. And after reading those, I realized this is a skill that everybody needs to The Art to of have. Negotiation by? I think it's Michael Wheeler. Mm -hmm. Michael Wheeler, we'll check. Yes. Yeah, um, people will Google I, it anyway. I stand to be corrected. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's where I learned that, listen, you don't always have to move the post, you have to change your mind. Mm. Yeah, the post shouldn't be moving. Mm -hmm. It's your mindset that should be it's moving. It's very powerful. Can you say that again? You don't have to, the post should never move. Mm -hmm. It's your mind that the, has to shift. The posts are what? Your the values? post, like your goal post. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't move it closer because the players are tired. Mm -hmm. We change the players. Yes. That is really what it means, like having a possible zone of agreement. Mm -hmm. If this is not. So the goals the, should not be negotiated or whittled down. No. Never. Because mm. <laughs> you're the one that's going to be staying up all night thinking about it and beating yourself up for not speaking out, not thinking a yeah. certain way. Or regretting in future. That regretting in future and mm. having now starting second guessing yourself and everything that you do because you've made a lot of decisions that didn't really benefit yeah. you. Mm -hmm. The passive culture. So knowing um, the art of negotiation and understanding that it is a human science. Yeah. Really, that's where the growth comes from. Hmm. Yeah. Speaking specifically uh, to our culture on the subject of uh, excellence, what change or what suggestion would you make or what's the one thing that you think we need to, to really work on and change? I think the one thing that we need to work on and it will just have a ripple effect on everything is attitudes. Mm -hmm. The attitude in the workplace, if it means somebody going for a therapy session to, session to unlearn certain toxic traits, they have to. Because uh, we have this very passive culture, the worst could have happened. And it, is, it gives people comfort, but at the same time, people tend to be passive because, you know, the worst didn't happen. Mm. Yeah, so once you know exactly what it is that you want mm. you start focusing on how you're going to get that thing mm. if I'm talking to you now I'd like to deliver the service to you and maybe you don't see the value yet it's okay mm. but it's not my job as a service provider to teach you the value I'm supposed mm. to deliver the value because mm -hmm. I'm going to end up spending unaccounted time and effort and on the, teaching you about something Sometimes it's worth it in the long run. It is mm. if a client is committed mm. to getting the service. Mm -hmm. If it's not, it's fine. Mm. We can shelve it for now. And mm. then once you understand it, we can continue the conversation. Yeah. So this issue of attitude, being laid back, um, at what level should interventions take place to change it? Is it individual level, company, societal level, or at a political level? I think at every level, mm -hmm. but the most important level is individual level because you can't transform everybody. Mm. We have different priorities, different backgrounds, different goals, mm -hmm. and different personal perceptions of who we really are. Yes. Some people are power oriented. So if what yeah, I'm suggesting, say maybe if you say, listen, I need you to speak less on this matter and I feel like it makes me a terrible person. I might say yes because I'm shy and I don't want conflict, I'm afraid of confrontation, but I might just say no, mm. that affects how mm. people perceive me. Mm. I'm this type of person, so... In other words, you preserve your brain. You, exactly. Mm. So I think it also comes down to you, like I was saying, having mm -hmm. a zone of possible agreement. Yeah. And sticking to it because you end up betraying yourself. Yeah. Once you betray yourself, you're going to shift everything else to make that mistake okay. Yeah. Speaking of branding, your, your brother is an expert in this area. I've interviewed him. He's established himself as a, a brand who is a master of brands. Um, has his role um, or his position as, as a, uh, you know, a master teacher on, on brands helped you in any way, shape or form? It does. I actually do follow his steps. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just learning from the best, basically. Mm. Mm. And I still consult with him. As good as I, I know I'm doing, mm. if there's better than I am, than mm. I'm doing, then definitely I'll find out from him. Mm. He's also my 
very close friend, so sometimes he just tells me straight, like, listen, mm. this is not the ceiling. I don't know why you're settling. Or, mm. listen, you're doing great, but mm. it's, it's not translating to anything. Do you mind telling us how he has, has helped you set your brand? Any specific um, aha moments from him? Brand-wise, I can't say there have been, but business-wise, he's mm -hmm. big on logic. Mm -hmm. I will come to him complaining about a customer. He's like, listen, we spoke about this before. Is there no place to escalate? Mm. Or why are you going in circles? What does the contract say? Mm. There's a contract for that reason. You drafted the contract. So mm. Mm. you're either going to enforce it or we're going to stop talking about this. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So he's helped me to really understand decision support. Mm -hmm. One, as a leader and as an employee within okay. my engagement. So okay. All right, um, this is the time of the show where you grab your crystal ball <laughs> and look into the future and tell us what we can uh, anticipate in terms of brand Monkori, talking 5, 10. I'd, I'd like to think more about 10, 15 years from now. Thank you. I am young enough to plan for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really, like I was saying earlier, I'm big on transforming the culture organizationally. I do have target clients and goals in terms of what I want to deliver and the impact that I want to have in my exchanges, mm -hmm. whether it's at a business or personal level. It's something that I've really set out. I have the career objectives and the plan to feed that. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily that I want it to be known with statistics countrywide, but it's something that is also a very personal thing because it's something I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is a part of my life fulfillment plan, mm -hmm. not just a career plan to deliver skills, to transform people and org organizations for continuity, and also to contribute to literature. Mm -hmm. In Botswana, there's not much on projects of any kind. Mm. And whatever we do have, it really is more from the West or the North or whatever. Mm. But it's not, it doesn't speak to the organizational cultures here. Mm. So our younger generations are learning, but it's not cultured for environment. Mm. So we tend to struggle more when we get to corporate because what we learned revolves around other cultures. Mm -hmm. Technology-wise, skills-wise, we are still yeah, So what is it? Behind. what is it we can expect in 10 years? What, what are you going to bring into um, fruition? Yes, uh, we do actually have programs under accreditation that speak more to the new skills, the new core skills, mm -hmm. like organizational psychology. So once those are ready, we will be launching those and partnering with organizations, mm -hmm. um, even NGOs, so that we can enable the people who mm. actually can are you, are you planning skills? to eventually create an academy, a school, an institution, or a company that is penetrating across the region and international? Uh, that's the kind of thing I want you to, mm -hmm. to share on. Well, at the moment, I'd say the immediate um, time frame being the five years to mm. establish the company so that it has the authority. Mm. Yeah. And the data from these projects to advise, listen. This is why we're saying we can have an academy. Mm -hmm. It has to be results driven. Mm -hmm. As much as it's a goal to own academies, I also need to validate why this academy mm. is the academy that all companies should be collaborating with. Because mm -hmm. our concern is self um, sufficiency. Mm. Yeah, and improving ambidexterity across. Okay. I need to know, listen, I have these other skills that I could be exploring and exploiting. If I'm not earning You call enough, it ambi? Ambidextrous. Yeah, 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 being able to, to use both um, hands. Okay. Yes, mm. that is why Transformit was formed in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So 10 years, definitely, an academy would be there. But in the next five, I want to be the partner for every organization yeah. that knows the value of transformation. Okay, there's a question that I normally ask, uh, which I've been always urged by the young ones, uh, both Taha and the like, to ask whether there's Zaga in this industry that you are in. <laughs> and if <laughs> so, <laughs> if there's Zaga, what sort of Zaga, what can, I mean, so that, you know, we talked about whether Zaga inspires people or not, but it does to some extent. It does. It mm. does to a very big extent. Mm. I will not water that extent down. Mm. It's there, but it also comes to you knowing pricing strategies. Because mm -hmm. sometimes 
you know, I prize looking at the team. Sometimes I prize looking at the business impact that the service will have for the client. Mm -hmm. So you need to know, you always make money out of anything. It's how much money you want to make and how much money you make yourself worth. Mm. That is the question that we really should be asking ourselves. And it's there, but also th like factors like cost of reproduction, cost of delay, they affect how much money ends up in your pocket. Mm. Or nothing. But this industry you are in, there's cash. There's cash because also some of the, serv the services we offer are ad hoc and some of the things like training, um, HRDC does help companies to train, so mm. it's not a matter of the funds, it's a matter of the value now for mm -hmm. the company. So, you know, there are certain, which is also another thing, you need to have essential services, not just because you're good at something. Mm -hmm. That's that's really where the money now comes in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is the time now where you hit me with a question. Do you have a question for me? <laughs> uh, my question is... From the nuggets of wisdom, the episodes that you've had, are we going to get like um, maybe just a summary? I don't know if it would be in the form of a book or like learnings from it, because you've had so many brilliant people, and there's people who unfortunately have not had the time to appreciate every episode, but are we going to get like key takeaways? Mm. That's a brilliant idea because I've seen um, uh, I've seen some 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 of the podcasters internationally. Um, a guy called Tim something comes to mind who wrote a book called uh, something of Titans, uh, the Book of Titans, mm -hmm. where he summarized the learnings from from his guests. But this idea has never before been brought to my mind, and I, I would like to thank you. It's a brilliant thank idea. Thank you. It is really it what we do at Transform It. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you for, 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 for placing the seed in my, my mind. Let's see how it germinates and grows. Uh, I think it's a brilliant idea, one that is worthy of pursuit because I've been wowed. And even this interview, I've been wowed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot to, to learn there. So it's a great suggestion. Let me explore it. Thank you. I'll be happy to partner with you should you need external consulting. Absolutely. Ever. Now, take a look at that um, camera there and share final words of wisdom, parting words, words of encouragement to, with the viewer. Okay, my parting word of wisdom would be to always, always continue enjoying the thrill of finding out what else and who else you can become. Um, growth is continuous, be growth orientated, not goal orientated, and do not betray yourself in everything that you do, make sure it's within your zone of possible benefit and value. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Share with them all your contacts, including on social media. Okay. I personally am on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube as Mungkori Mashara, but my company, Transform It, or Transform IT is on all platforms and we have more content so in case you'd like to learn more about some of the topics that we're discussing with Ramu Khobe, we do have content on our LinkedIn and YouTube pages. Okay, yeah. you've been a great guest, eh? You've Thank you, it's wonders. been such an honor. Thank you. Thank you.